Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Nursing, a Pathway to Empowerment for Women. I am Becky Schaefer, Global Program Manager at Sigma Theta Tau International. Sigma Theta Tau International Society of Nursing, known as Sigma, has more than 135,000 members in 92 countries around the world. Our mission is developing nurse leaders anywhere to improve healthcare everywhere. Our strength lies in the fact that our members are nurse leaders from all specialties, clinicians, educators, researchers, administrators, and more from different walks of life and from all over the world. We are pleased to collaborate with the International Council of Nurses. ICN is a federation of more than 130 nurses associations representing almost 28 million nurses worldwide. Founded in 1899, ICN is the world's first and widest reaching international organization for health professionals. Operated by nurses and leading nurses internationally, ICN works to ensure quality nursing care for all, sound nursing policies globally, the advancement of nursing knowledge, and the presence worldwide of a respected nursing profession and a competent and satisfied nursing workforce. We was, would also like to thank our presenters, who you will meet shortly, for sharing their expertise with us today. Attendees are eligible for one contact hour as a result of today's webinar. Sigma is accredited as a provider of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. To receive contact hours for this continuing nurse education session, participants are required to attend the webcast and complete the evaluation form, which will be emailed to all attendees approximately two days after the webinar. The speakers and planning committee members have disclosed no conflicts of interest. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. As you have the, excuse me, there we go. As you have the opportunity to receive continuing nursing education credits by attending, SIG, by attending, Sigma is required to share the learning outcome of the webinar. It is 50% of attendees will identify one way women can achieve economic empowerment. Oops, excuse me. I got my slides backwards. I am my apologies. How you can participate. At the top right of your screen is the control panel. To open and close your control panel, click the orange arrow. Please submit your questions, thoughts, and comments via the questions panel, also located on your control panel, throughout the discussion. What we would like everyone to do is to test the questions feature by entering in what capacity you work in healthcare. Could be an emergency room nurse, as a professor, student, or someone who writes policy. So please take a moment to do so and make sure to hit the send button so the message makes it to us. It's always nice to see what areas of the nursing profession are represented in our webinars. Give everybody a second to do that. And in the meantime, we'll move forward. All right, now I'll turn the presentation over to Erica Burton, Senior Advisor, Nursing and Health Policy, International Council of Nurses, who will be your moderator today. You have the floor, Erica. Hi, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you, Becky, for that introduction. I'm Erica Burton, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor at the International Council of Nurses, and I'm gonna moderate this webinar today. Um, welcome to everyone and thank you for participating in this webinar. Um, I am speaking from Toronto, Canada, and I want to acknowledge the land um, I am grateful to be speaking to you from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The topic of today's web webinar was originally for the um, combined Sigma and ICN parallel event at the 64th Commission on the Status of Women, which was meant to be held in New York in March. 
of course that's canceled, um, but we're so happy to be able to host it virtually. And the way that this allows others to participate who wouldn't traditionally have been able to come to New York City um, is, is fantastic. So the commission is the main interne intergovernmental body um, of the UN, and it's exclusively dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. 2020 was a special year as it marked the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Bayesian Declaration and Platform for Action. So 2020 is pivotal um, because it was meant to be for the accelerated realization of gender equality and empowerment of all women everywhere. In this year of the nurse and the midwife, uh, our two organizations, Sigma and ICN, wanted to celebrate women um, in their role as nurses and as carers. As you know, the majority of the, of the workforce, uh, the nursing workforce, are women. We know that the evidence is clear. Advancing and investing in the nursing profession will make for a healthier world, support gender equality, and contribute to economic prosperity. The impact of this will be immense for the empowerment of women, and we both strongly feel that this should be seen as a key pathway to advancing this agenda. So this was the impetus for our original parallel event and now for this webinar over the next hour or so. This morning, we will hear from a number of speakers to illustrate just how this can be achieved. Um, and we want to get your brains working early this morning. So we're going to start off the webinar with a poll question. So you'll see it come up on the screen and just please select uh, the best answer um, possible. And we'll give everyone a few minutes. So the question is, in which region is the highest percentage of the nursing workforce female? Your choices are Western Pacific, the Americas, Southeast Asia, Europe, or Eastern Mediterranean. So we're just collecting the responses here. Now you'll all have to brush up on your geography as well after this. And surely Becky will show the answers on the screen. Okay, so um, folks participating on the webinar think that the Americas um, has the highest percentage of the nursing workforce who are female. Um, in a couple of minutes, you will hear from Lisa and she will have the real answer to this question. Uh, so please hang tight. So um, without further delay, I want to move to our first speakers. Uh, our first speakers are Rick and Lisa. Rick. Ricciardi is a professor and director of strategic partnerships for the Center for Health Policy and Media Engagement at the George Washington University School of Nursing. Prior to joining GW, Dr. Ricciardi served as, as the Director, Division of Practice Improvement and the Senior Advisor for Nursing at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Dr. Ricciardi served on active duty in the Army for 30 years, where he held numerous positions as a pediatric and family nurse practitioner clinical scientist and senior leader. In his last two assignments on active duty, Dr. Ricciardi served as Chief, Chief Nursing Research at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and Director of Research at the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury. Dr. Ricciardi is the current president of Sig Sigma Theta Tau International. The next speaker that we'll have in this session is Lisa Little. Lisa has over 25 years experience in healthcare and has established her consulting practice in 2010, which focuses on health research and policy, planning, analysis, strategy development, facilitation, and project management. Lisa is also currently a member of the International Council of Nurses Board of Directors. She's a member of the Nursing Now Canada Steering Committee and is the vice chair of the Board of Directors of Rural Healthcare Innovations. She was previously at the Canadian Nurses Association, where she served as Director of Policy for over 10 years. So without further delay, uh, Richard, you have the floor. Thank you, Erica. It certainly is a pleasure to be with everyone today. 
I'm very excited to be able to participate in this presentation on the pathway to empowerment for women. As said, I'm, I'm the president of Sigma Theta Tau International. And again, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, next slide. I don't think, do I have the power to move slides or? Okay. So what I was asked to talk about is what we are doing to advance the nursing profession through the lens of strengthening and focusing health systems around primary health care, an area which I've spent probably the, the majority of my career in, is in been ambulatory care. I've always, you know, we, have, we heard the term hospitalist. I've always considered myself an ambulist. Most of my career has been focused on improving health processes, the delivery of care, and uh, translating evidence into the provider's hands so that providers can provide real-time evidence-based treatment in, around primary health care. Next slide, please. So in terms of advancing, uh, let's take a look at what we are really doing well that will help us to continue to advance the strategies of nursing. And one is uh, we are really uh, developing and building and strengthening a global cadre of leaders. And in doing that, it, it empowers nurses uh, and, and since uh, the nursing workforce is predominantly women, women to translate that leadership uh, skills, attributes, and knowledge into other areas. For example, entrepreneurship, being on boards of directors, uh, running for office, being an elected member of, uh, of uh, their country's uh, political system, uh, and being at the corporate level uh, in, in terms of running a uh, large corporation. So by strengthening uh, and becoming a, a strong nurse leader, those nursing uh, and leadership skills can translate and, and uh, allow nurses to move healthcare, either the business of healthcare or translating areas around healthcare to um, strengthen their capabilities. Next slide, please. In addition, we have become extremely capable uh, long, I've been a nurse for 40 years and I've seen lots of transformations around uh, our capabilities, both from uh, an individual level, but also at a strategic up level amongst organizations to come together to have a shared mental model on uh, a unified voice. For example, in looking at the sustainable development goals and ICN strategic priorities, you do, you do see that there are there is an emphasis in primary health care, which I love, of course, because that's my area. It's an area that I feel is incredibly important uh, in, in, in terms of the development of nurses and nurse leaders in that area is very strategic in my mind. Next slide, please. In addition to that, um, we are uh, we are really strengthening our narrative. And what I like to talk about is the nursing archetype. And that archetype is, uh, is representative of not only women, but men. However, with nursing being the uh, women, the largest work, part of the workforce, that archetype really is representative for a lot of women. And one nursing nurse, one of the uh, uh, goals of nursing now is to really strengthen the narrative of who nurses are and to rebrand in ways that strengthen uh, how we're perceived and how we can lead and develop a really strong archetype and persona of, of what that nurse and that nurse leader, that nurse clinician, that nurse policymaker, that nurse academician could look like. Next slide, please. However, in rebranding and recreating the narrative, that's really not enough to get us there. It's a big part of getting us telling the stories and, and, and providing uh, vignettes of how we're accomplishing that, but we also need data. And uh, with data, it allows uh, nurse leaders and nurses to really strengthen their voice and to strengthen their capabilities uh, and uh, making contributions and adding value of what nurses can do on the economic scale. And we all know how important health and well-being is to the economic prowess and acumen of a country. So uh, nurses are well positioned to be players in dictating what the economic uh, strengths of the country can be. And there's a lot of power in that. Next slide, please. 
And since I was the first presenter, I thought I would just remind us all that there are definitions of primary health care and ICN definition is there. And one of the goals that I see engaging and transforming nurses to be more involved in primary health care is that we are really making a difference in how we approach the concept of disparities and health inequities. Nurses get this, they're empowered to do this. And by being empowered to do that, it gives you a tremendous, a tremendous amount of acknowledgement by the local people, but also the policymakers and individuals in the country who are running the healthcare system. Because part of the goals of any country is to minimize or mitigate disparities and inequities. Next slide, please. In addition, the World Health Organization has uh, some good uh, information on a website around primary health care. And I'll just outline um, a primary health care approach includes three components, meeting people's health needs through their lives, which my perspective is that we as nurses and nurse leaders, nurse academics, nurse policymakers, need to really move away from the concept that primary health care is a place where people go to that has walls. Primary health care is not a fixed facility. Primary health care is getting out with the people, understanding the culture and the context of the people that you are, are caring for and de designing the care in a way that meets the cultural, economic and strategic needs of, of that culture and that area where you're practicing. Who better than nurses can do that? Addressing the broader determinants of health through multi, uh, multi-sectoral policy and action. We can't do this alone. We all know that nurses are very will partner with other professions to develop strategies to really empower the healthcare delivery system uh, providers to deliver the kind of primary health care that really is needed. Next slide, please. So in, in reaching out for primary health care, which I believe is the, is, the, is the bridge to the future of health care, regardless of what country you're coming from, this is to me is, is uh, uh, a solid strategic objective, is to improve primary health care wherever you're at. And knowing that that bridge to primary health care is going to have to take the component of a rural area like the CU Bridge on the left, which is connecting two towns in Taiwan, that there's no roads and there's no way to get there. The only way to get to that town is to cross this bridge. So uh, how, how we as nurses uh, think about how we're approaching primary health care strategically as well as delivering. And, you know, we are at the grounds, we are at the, you know, the ground level of delivering the kind of care. So whether we're looking at, you know, all of the things that are on the horizon, whether it's obesity, sedentarism, addiction, mental illness, uh, antibiotic and antimicrobial resistance, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, public health emergencies like we're dealing with now, or maternal child health issues, we need to figure out how to do that and deliver the kind of care. Or if you're in an urban setting, uh, like on the right, like in Melbourne, Australia, uh, you know, it's a different context, but the same sort of health issues that prevail. Next slide, please. If there's one thing that we've all learned, as a, as, a, as a solidarity of nurses, particularly from this COVID crisis that we are all connected. So moving forward and thinking about how we in primary health care can, nurses in primary health care can be more empowered is for us to continue to do what we do well is to stay connected, to share best practices, to conduct the kind of research, to think about what this expanding the role of the RN, the APRN or the APN, uh, the researcher, how that researcher is integrating primary care and primary health care in the research. I'm not saying we should move out of the acute care setting, obviously, but we need to think about both the acute care setting, the long-term care setting, and the primary health setting to really think about how that care is integrated, knowing we're all connected. Next slide, please. So the gist of my presentation is really about uh, moving forward, how we as nurses and uh, can be more empowered is to think about how we can become more media intentional. One thing that we've learned from the COVID crisis is that we have a push-pull system. We've had a lot of media that has reached out to nurses to inform the public, to inform policymakers, to inform the news about what's really happening. So I think moving forward, one of the things that we should work on as a group of nurses is to strengthen our media uh, capabilities. So build your social media and virtual presence. 
learn and write op-eds, learn and make elevator speeches and be prepared to pitch whatever is happening in your area. You, you know, nurses are so valued, they're so trusted, and that is a big leverage in terms of how you can be prepared to pitch what's happening and people will listen. And lastly, strengthen your media knowledge, skills, and capabilities, both organically by taking courses or being involved in media, but by also putting yourself out there. And, and you know, when someone asks if you want to speak on a radio or you want to speak on TV or you want to write something for the newspaper, get out there and do it. And, you know, partner with people that are experienced to help you do that. Next slide. Um, I'm suggesting that you become media intentional by cultivating your persona and the archetype you want to be and represent you across all media venues, whether you know, you're a subject matter expert in COVID or you're a subject matter expert in diabetes or you're a subject matter expert uh, in a translational, uh, trans, 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 translational science, uh, et cetera. And it's also very important that we as a nursing community keep up what's going on with local, regional, and global world happenings and integrate those world happenings into our narrative and help us to tell stories and collect data that is gonna be uh, real time and valuable in the moment. Next slide, please. Um, I guess we really can't have any presentation without mentioning COVID and, and I think COVID uh, uh, has been um, a challenging for all of us. We've seen nurse colleagues get sick. Some of us have seen nurse colleagues die. We've seen health colleagues die and get sick. We've seen patients suffer and die alone. All of these things have had tremendous pressure and you know the fallout from that is gonna be uh, seen decades to come. However, there are uh, positive sides to this. Um, and one is that nursing has been seen as one of the key components of successful uh, uh, attack on the COVID. And there's been many stories that have been told about nurses and the bravery of nurses. So moving forward, I think we need to continue to capitalize on that. We need to tell our story. We need to tell the world who we are and what we're doing. And that will strengthen and empower us and provide us with additional uh, fortitude to move forward. Next slide, please. The time to do this is now. As this says, now is cool. So there's no time to wait. We need to get out. We need to hustle. We need to uh, develop our media uh, presence, we need to strengthen our media capabilities and get out there and show the world who we really are as nurses and, and get engaged. So next slide, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, and together we are a solidarity of nurses and, and we are Sigma. So I look forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers. Again, it's been an honor to be with you today and I wish you to all be safe and well during these challenging times. Thank you so much, Rick. Lisa, the floor is now yours. Thanks very much. And uh, I think that's a nice segue from Rick's into my presentation uh, on behalf of ICN. I wanted to share with you some of our more recent events that uh, we believe are contributing to the empowerment of women, and namely through the Year of the Nurse and Midwife, the COVID-19 response, and some other um, uh, publications that we're moving to try and advance the profession forward. Next slide, please. So we all know that uh, this is the year of the nurse and midwife, the first time ever, probably the only time in my lifetime. Um, but events like these don't happen out of nowhere. And um, ICN and the Nursing Now campaign were very um, strong in their advocacy efforts in going to the WHO to request that this be the year of the uh, nurse and midwife in order to um, be part of the celebrations of Florence Nightingale's um, bicentennial. And of course, this was supported by the WHO executive and the full um, World Health Assembly in May. This year was to really profile uh, nurses and women and the role that they play within uh, healthcare, how we, as Rick referred to, we help economies, uh, we improve the health of populations. And so investing in nursing and investing in recruitment and retention strategies um, and advancing the roles that nurses play can really contribute to better societies and better healthcare and better economies. Next slide, please. 
Of course, um, Dr. Tedros uh, has been very much a strong supporter of ICN, and I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, if any of you were at the Singapore Congress, you heard his kind words of admiration and respect for nurses and the critical role that they play in the system. Our close relationship uh, between ICN and Dr. Tedros has really helped us advance the, the nursing and the global health agenda within um, both WHO and the, and the more broader global health policy agenda. Next slide, please. So the year 2020 started off great. Um, as uh, Rick referred to, we were getting some great media attention around the year of the nurse and midwife. Um, even the Pope himself came up with some very kind words um, in regard to nurses in January. Next slide, please. There was a whole year of activities planned uh, for the year of the nurse and midwife. Uh, it began in January with um, the president of ICN and Dr. Tedros um, from WHO writing joint letters to heads of states around the world, um, asking them to recognize the year of the nurse and midwife, asking them to send their chief nurse or midwifery officer um, to the World Health Assembly in May, and if they didn't have one, to please uh, put one in place. Um, so that was a great uh, first step on the way. You can see there was a number of other events and uh, activities planned throughout the year. As Rick referred to, the State of the World's Nursing Report, uh, International Nurses Day, we had triad meetings culminating in a bicentennial in October at the end of the year. Can okay, next slide, please. But then COVID happened and that changed everything. Um, and so what it's done is actually been a huge challenge for nurses and some and identified some of the weaknesses in the system particularly in terms of the protection of nurses but it also put nurses in a spotlight within the media that we to a level that we never could have imagined before next slide please um, ICN very much began a media campaign um, once the um, cases in China were, were announced. We wrote a letter of support to China and nurses, nurse, national nursing associations, which are ICN's members elsewhere, um, to express our concern and our support and how could we help you. And that opened up the floodgates. We started to receive letters and notices from many of our national nursing associations around the world around the challenges they were facing, how their nurses were becoming infected, how there wasn't proper PPE, etc. And so that really opened up a lot of great uh, relationship and strengthened the relationships we had with our NNAs um, to better understand and be sort of on the pulse of what was happening with nursing around the world. We started to bring some of those concerns um, to uh, the WHO uh, Director General around um, the coronavirus and what we were hearing from our members. And we started putting out m multiple press releases throughout the years. And these are just a sample of some of the ones that we put out as the time went on in the months uh, leading up to even most recent days, particularly around some of the health policy challenges around the what nurses were seeing and the mental health impacts that was having on them, certainly the lack of structural supports and PPE and other things um, became forefront. It also became to our attention that there was no way to capture the data um, of how many healthcare workers were being infected or where they were being infected. Um, and so we started to move on that um, media attention as well and sort of ramp up the, the voice on that, requesting that there be systems put in place to capture this. Next slide, please. So this is where we are at as of June 15th. You can see the distribution. Some countries, as we know, have experienced um, COVID um, to a degree more than others. It seems to be moving forward in other areas of the country. What we did in that was we held, ICN held webinars with um, our national nursing associations to help inform those who had not yet experienced COVID to the degree that others had, to share lessons learned, to share best practices, to share their experiences, good or bad, actually. Um, so um, we had uh, stories from countries such as and nursing associations from Taiwan, Taiwan and China and South Korea and Italy, where we had some of the promising and most um, strict measures that help flatten the curve, and in other countries where they've seen some of the worst devastation, particularly on the impact to nurses and their death rates. Next slide, please. 
So as this went along, ICN was capturing its own data from our national nursing associations on the number of nurses infected and the number of nurses that have died from COVID-19. And as of June 3rd, uh, we had at least 600 nurses who unfortunately and tragically have died from COVID-19. And as I said, there is no systematic or standardized reporting of these infections or deaths. And uh, that we feel is very important, not only to respect and capture the lost lives uh, in the nursing profession, but really to inform um, future responses, to help uh, efforts to flatten curves, to understand, because if nurses are taken out of the system, nurses are not there to provide care to the COVID patients, to do the contact tracing and the testing, et cetera. We know which is the critical role of nurses in these um, public health emergencies. And so there will be further spread of the COVID-19 without appropriate supply of nurses. So for many reasons, we think it's very important that we have those numbers. If we go to the next slide, please, and you take those numbers and we extrapolate, the data that ICN has collected, as I say, from 30 countries, in the blue line shows the number of infections, healthcare workers, not nurses specifically, in 30 countries. If we extrapolate that to a global level, there's an estimated half a million healthcare workers infected potentially in this in this. Um, in the globe. And we know that nurses are the largest occupational group within healthcare and suffering probably the highest number of infections. Next slide, please. And to one of the most important points um, that relates to the empowerment of women and the gender lens in this all is that as we know, as Erica mentioned, the nursing workforce is largely female. The data that was captured in the State of the World's Nursing Report that Rick referred to shows that nine out of 10 uh, nurses globally are female. There is regional variation. Um, in the African region, the female to male ratio is three to one. And males only outnumber females in 13 countries out of the world of the 194 uh, member states of the World Health Organization. The, as per the poll that you heard earlier, the share of women is highest at 95% in the Western Pacific region, so not the Americas, and lowest at 76% in the African region. And so by that measure, we know that many of the people who uh, will be infected by this by sheer nature uh, will be women, um, which is unfortunate and unjust. Next slide, please. And so ICN have put out a call to action recently. Um, I think this, um, did I miss the slide? Perhaps. Um, uh, ICN has posted a number of resources available on its website. It's also launched continuing education, uh, specifically on COVID-19 in partnership with the World Continuing Education Alliance to support nurses uh, around the world on that. Next slide, please. And the media attention that ICN has captured, um, which fits nicely, as Rick was saying, really fits with the um, message about getting the the point about getting your message out. Nursing has been able to garner much media attention, uh, both in a positive way uh, around the the role that they play in flattening the curve, our role in public health, the critical role in healthcare that nurses play, but also unfortunately in the um, saddening news around the death and the infection rates of nurses, but really pushing the, the agenda on the lack of PPE and some of the mental health supports that will be needed um, for nurses uh, in the future. Next slide, please. Throughout all of this, uh, despite COVID-19, we were able to continue to publish a number of publications uh, that we believe continue to help advance nursing, advance the profession, and continue to the empowerment of women. That includes the State of the World's Nursing Report, as I mentioned, the Nurses IND Kit for International Nurses Day, which is a voice to lead, Nursing the World to Health. Uh, we put out core competencies in disaster nursing, the next version of those, and revised guidelines on advanced practice nursing, which can help identify more roles for nursing in the healthcare system. Again, more opportunities for nursing contributing to their economic status. Um, and so these are all on the ICN website if you haven't been able to, to look at them. Next slide, please. 
And last but not least, um, sorry, second last but not least, uh, we recently had the triad meetings, which is the chief nurse and midwifery officers from around the world with ICN's members, the National Nursing Associations and the Midwifery Association and their members. And these are some of the discussions we talked about. Certainly COVID-19 was on the agenda. The state of the world's nursing report and the data that that provides really we see that as a roadmap to strengthen nursing health systems and economies uh, we talked a little bit about the strategic directions for nursing and midwifery going forward and today actually the um, statement will be released from the triad so you can go to the website and see the sort of call to action that will come out of that and icn also had conversations with its own nnas to continue the dialogue around the COVID stories, the situation, and uh, priorities for them. Next slide, please. And finally, um, just to uh, put our plug in, I guess, for the ICN Congress in 2021, the call for abstracts is open. I hope you will submit. It is sort of the premier event for nursing globally. However, I just wanted to share with you, because many are probably wondering, uh, we do recognize the impact of COVID-19 and are putting, in plan some, are putting in place some contingency and alternate plans to explore what that might look like as a Congress. Perhaps it will be an all virtual Congress or a hybrid Congress. We know there's concerns obviously about gatherings, about people maybe not even wanting to travel. So we are exploring that and we'll get back to you probably by this fall in terms of what format the Congress will take. But at this point, we are still moving forward and we hope that you will be able to join us in that event, which we really saw as the premier event um, culminating after the year of the nurse and midwife and really being able to showcase and celebrate the role that nurses have had uh, played in uh, the COVID-19 response, which we hope will be lessened by that point and, and we'll be able to move forward. So thanks very much for your time today. Thank you so much, uh, Rick and Lisa. Um, I found it interesting you both spoke about the power of media and how that can elevate the, the voice of nurses and of women. Um, so I think becoming media intentional is so, so important as, as Rick mentioned. Um, and I think probably most of us on this webinar were not necessarily taught these skills. So it's about going out um, and getting these skills. And we've also seen the power of social media. Um, so we absolutely need to harness that. The next thing we'll do is we'll uh, put up another poll question um, and we'll have your answers to this. Just to reiterate that these are all anonymous. Um, this it might be a very vulnerable question. Um, and it's as a nurse and a woman, I feel comfortable speaking about my expertise in meetings, including when there are other health professionals and men in the room. So your answers are, I always feel this way. I feel this way most of the time. I feel this way sometimes, I never feel this way, and not applicable. So you can go ahead and put your answers in. Again, these are all anonymous, so your name will not be uh, displayed, and we have no idea um, who's answering what either. Okay, so the answers are up. So about 30% of participants always feel that as a woman and a nurse, they, um, they can speak about their expertise in meetings. 38% feel this way most of the time. 32% uh, feel this way sometimes. And 0% never feel this way. So I think that that's uh, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I think we could get stronger in the top. I always feel this way. Um, and I think that's what today's webinar is about doing. And the more we show um, the value um, of nursing and elevate the nursing voice, I think the more as nurses and as women, um, we will feel that that expertise counts and that we're being heard and listened to um, and involved in decision making. Um, so our next speaker uh, will be Liz Madigan. Liz is the Chief Executive Officer of Sigma Theta Tau International. She assumed the position in November 2017 following a 21-year period as a professor at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, uh, Case Western Reserve University, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. Her prior clinical background and her program of research focused on home health care. Liz, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. It's so nice to be with you all. And thank you to all the panelists as well as the participants. We look forward to hearing your questions and what you have to offer when we get to the question and answer. And please put those into the chat box. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to take a little different perspective and talk about um, some of the things that ground us in this and really talk about um, women's empowerment and economic development. Next slide, please. So I want to remind you with the sustainable development goals that these apply to every country. Unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which are really designed for lower and middle income countries, the SDGs were purposely developed to apply to every country. As well, there's been a lot of work by nurses about how nursing and health impact each one of the goals for the SDGs. So I think sometimes we get hung up on three because it's focused on health, but in fact, nursing has contributions to make to all of these. And we see a lot of that with our, with our co nurse colleagues who are doing work, for example, in environmental health and environmental justice. Next slide, please. So Rick talked somewhat about primary health care. I want to focus on a couple of things that are a little different from the primary health care perspective. I want to focus on the fact that it involves um, promotion, prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care. I also want to fo focus on the piece that we really focus on the comprehensive and interrelated aspects of physical, mental, social health, and well-being. So when we talk about nursing and nursing education, focusing holistic and the multidimensional pieces of everything that happens in someone's life, we really do have contributions to make here to primary health care. Next slide, please. I also want to talk a little bit about universal health coverage to make sure we're all grounded in the same understanding of what that means. And it really is focused on promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative health services. It really is focused on the opportunity to provide this care to people regardless of where they are so that they don't undergo a financial burden. It needs to be of high quality. And again, I'm going to remind you, promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative health services. If you think about our, our other providers of health care, I would argue that in most cases, nurses are the only ones who are really educated to provide care across all of these. Many of our colleagues provide care in, in a curative way or in a rehabilitative way. Um, but I would argue that nurses are really the ones who have the most broad applicability with universal health coverage. Next slide, please. So what, what does this have to do? Where's nursing's role in the SDGs in universal health coverage and primary health care? If we think about where nurses are and healthcare happens everywhere, as Rick talked about, it's not a building. Primary health care is not a building. But in universal health coverage requires that healthcare happens everywhere. Where are nurses? Nurses are everywhere. Unlike many other healthcare professions, we really are in every place where there are people who need care. Remember also that primary health care applies to individuals, families, and communities. Again, this is something that nurse, nursing education has focused on for quite some time. We're all prepared to do this along some way. And remember that primary health care requires that whole person holistic care across the lifespan. Again, another nursing, another nursing strength in my argument. And so I've already said that nurses are educated on all the elements of UHC. And because, I, because of our presence throughout the community to provide all the aspects of UHC, we can then influence all the SDGs through advocacy and interventions. So in many cases, nurses often think of themselves as providing care just to an individual or a family or a community, but they don't often recognize the fact that because of our abilities to provide primary health care, in a universal health coverage approach, we can actually influence all the SDGs. And this is a great opportunity for us. And I think we really need to, as has been discussed, get the word out on what we have to offer. I'm not sure that this is widely recognized. I know from watching social media, there's not always a good understanding of nursing's contributions. So I think the more we can get the word out on what our contributions can be, the more effective we can be. Next slide, please. So I just want to focus on just a couple other figures. Lisa presented some of these. I want to, I want to identify a couple others. Remind, remember, nurses account for 59% of the health sector employees. 
um, one of the things that came out of the State of the World's Nursing Report is that we really need to be focused on enhancing our educational programs. There need to be standards that are developed, the standards need to be attained, and additional faculty are needed. I'm not sure this has always become clear to the rest of the nursing workforce is that the only way we can really get to where we need to be is with additional faculty. The good news is from the report that 53% of the countries who reported have advanced practice roles. This is critical. This is critical to our development and to us being able to take a place at the table. And then finally, the last piece I thought was really relevant to this presentation today from the State of the World's Nursing Report is that many nurses were not educated in the country where they practice. So if we're looking for opportunities for women in general, women who wish to migrate may wanna think about nursing as an opportunity because of the mi nurse migration. And clearly there have been uh, missteps in nurse migration. There are international standards for nurse migration. These are well established and I think we need to do it right. But at the same time, I think it is an opportunity. Next slide, please. So the triad meeting, as, as Lisa discussed, um, happened last week, and they had two pieces that were related to gender parity from that meeting. Um, and you'll see the statement, as she said, will be coming out. So there's um, an identification of the deeply seated gender-based discrimination. And I just sort of clipped part of this. I didn't include the entire piece of this. I would encourage you to look at that. Um, but I think it identifies that we still have gender issues um, that really impact how nursing is practiced. Um, impacts midwifery that we really need to help work on more of a societal approach as well as a health system approach. And then the commitment and the follow-up action are really identified within the statement to identify and enable gender-sensitive work environments to really help provide leadership development opportunities and that midwives and nurses should lead these efforts in the work environment. Next slide, please. So I'll just remind you, there's a need for 18 million more healthcare workers. Half of these will be nurses. If we're going to achieve universal health coverage and provide primary health care and attaining the SDGs, we have to make investments in healthcare and the nursing workforces. The other piece is, is that there's long-standing evidence in global health that employing women contributes to family and community well-being and economic development. And then employing women in healthcare as nurses, as midwives, as community health workers also contributes to family and community well being and economic development. So, if we really want to raise the status of everyone in the world, we need to really focus on educating women, employing women. Healthcare is a great opportunity for women as long as we can address the gender discrimination issues. And then I, I close with a quote from Dr. Tedros. And I want to really focus on the last sentence, and that's why I put it in bold. But we also know women's economic opportunities will advance and their children's health and development will follow in step. So that when we achieve universal health coverage, we'll reduce poverty, we'll create jobs, we'll grow economies, and communities will be protected against disease outbreaks. And I'll just point out that this, was, this, this came from 2018, long before COVID arrived. So I think focusing on knowing that women's economic opportunities are one way that can be done with support of nursing and to get more women into nursing is one way to really help develop this. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, you're absolutely right. I think nurses are absolutely in the best position to be creating, developing, and enabling gen uh, gender sensitive work environments for women. Um, and so we can really be at the forefront of that, especially considering that we are the majority of the health workforce, so power, power in numbers. Um, we're going to do one final poll question before we move to the next set of speakers. So I'll have Becky put that up on the screen. And so this question asks, in which of the following areas have you observed the most improvement in your country, state, or local area in the last year? And this is pre-COVID. <clears throat> so thinking about that, has there been improved recognition of the contribution of nurses? Has there been inclusion of nurses in addressing the health needs of communities? Has there been investment in leadership education for nurses? Um, or have you seen more nurses engaging in political advocacy? 
So that's the most improvement um, in your country, state, or local area pre-COVID. And this would also be a very interesting question actually to look at um, post-COVID. Um, so we'll have to ask this again in the future. So the answers are coming in. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay. So 46% uh, of participants on this webinar say that they've seen improved recognition of the contribution of nurses, uh, which makes which makes sense. Um, absolutely something that, as you heard from all of the speakers so far, that we are um, trying to work on. 26% of participants um, say that the most improvement have been in inclusion of nurses in addressing the health needs of communities. 20% of you investment in leadership education for nurses and then only 9% um, nurses engaging in political advocacy. So I think we see where we're, we're the strongest. I think all of these areas, absolutely, we all need to work towards advancing, but certainly what this shows just from this quick poll is that we need to be more engaged in political advocacy, um, getting nurses involved, as, as Rick mentioned, actually translating those skills into leadership skills, to be policymakers, um, to be involved in politics. Um, so, so food for thought. I want to introduce now um, our next speaker, and um, and that's Pam Cipriano. Um, sorry, Pam, your this is. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Your bio has disappeared from my screen. I do wish to say that um, Pam is the vice president of the International Council of Nurses. Um, I will hand over the floor to you, Pam, um, as the dean um, and Sadie Health Cabinet Professor at the University of Virginia School of Nursing in the United States. Pam, the floor is yours. Thanks, Erica. I'm really pleased to be with all of you today. Uh, probably the only other thing that uh, I would share with you is I serve two terms as president of the American Nurses Association, which is the National Nursing Association member of the International Council of Nurses from the United States. So we're going to talk about the social, political, and economic empowerment, which is really still evolving for every single one of us. So it's important to think about where you are right now in your career, in your professional development, as we work through talking about and understanding this type of empowerment, where we still have work to go, and where we're doing well. Next slide, please. So even though power has five letters, it is not, it is, it is something that is incredibly powerful. Some people think of it as a four letter word, if that's uh, something you're accustomed to as a saying in your countries, but it is really so important. This happens to be me and Lisa, who you just heard from a little bit ago, and Annette Kennedy, president of the International Council of Nurses. Uh, really looking at, at uh, the work that was, has been done by Women Deliver, who, who we've begun to work with because we think it is so important that we do recognize the fact that, it, that empowerment is necessary for us to not only get our messages out, but for us to be able to have influence around the world in everything healthcare. But then as you've heard with the SDGs, it is so many aspects of life where nurses have a tremendous impact based on what we do. And many forms of empowerment are linked. So we're going to talk about social, economic, and political, but there's two other major areas, which is educational and psychological. They all are connected. And I'm always reminded of a phrase that, that was made popular by a previous International Council of Nurses and American Nurses president, Dr. Margreta Madden Stiles, who is credited as really advancing all of cred credentialing in nursing globally. But one of her famous phrases, and I won't read the whole thing, but it's, imagine a world without nurses. Next slide, please. We can't imagine a world without nurses because nurses are the backbone of our healthcare system. They are, again, uh, having influence in just about every walk of life. So when we think about social empowerment, we think about the need for a profession or a group to have autonomy. It also means that we have to develop self-confidence, uh, thinking about some of the, the earlier poll question, to think about how is it that we uh, can speak up and that we are comfortable. So some of it is individual action that we take and some of it is collective action. 
but targeted on the uh, issues of concern today are really our work to ensure gender equality and equity across healthcare. Now, another, another saying that uh, is so poignant in today's political events that uh, have, have really emerged from the social unrest around racist activity in the United States, but has touched every place around the globe, is a uh, quote from Paul Farmer, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong in the world. And we know we've been hearing the chorus of voices really saying all lives matter, which has always been paramount to nurses really looking at their role and duty. We are bound by our codes of ethics. Many of our countries have very strong codes of ethics. And so this is one of the roots of social empowerment. Next slide, please. We know that healthcare uh, and other social and economic services are really, again, fundamental to what we believe is important for us to advocate for. And we share this responsibility and supporting actions to meet all of the social needs of the public that we serve, particularly vulnerable populations. And that's recognized by the public. Uh, in the United States, for the last 18 years in a row, nurses are, are consistently voted the most honest and ethical, which is a revered position that we know is really important for us to maintain. And we've, but we now we've seen some changes with COVID. We've seen the fear in the public. We've had pronouncements made from the WHO to ask all governments to make sure that workers and nurses in particular are protected. So we've seen an unusual reversal. And I'll come back to this issue in a moment, but recognizing that, and I think uh, Rick talked about this too. Again, the public investing their trust in us is something that is, is held sacred. Next slide, please. We've also heard about nurses being the key to universal health coverage. Nurses are not just everywhere, they go to where they're needed. So whether it's danger zones, whether it's providing unpopular services, whether it's the full range of care as you heard Liz talk about, we really embrace the needs of the population because we know how important, whether it's mental health care or whether it's AIDS prevention or immunizations or education that will help bring people uh, out of poverty within their communities, that's where nurses go. Next slide, please. What's important about the work we do in social empowerment is, is once again related to social justice and our desire to eliminate oppression and discrimination. And we do that in part by looking at control of our own practice. We have been advocates for universal health coverage and in every country that work is different. Uh, we, we know that the economics of a country make a difference. Who's paying for health care? Uh, what are the different uh, services available? What is the penetration of that workforce? What is it that our communities need and how do we work together with, with those leaders? Social justice, again, sort of being a, a bedrock of concern for nurses to ensure that people are able to get the care they need, that they are not discriminated against, that whatever the, their, their social patterns, their religion, their ethnicity is not a bar to get it, being able to get health care. And so together, nurses are able to take advantage of this social empowerment to speak out on these issues, to provide care in many settings. Again, based on the foundation of, of being highly educated and also the psychological empowerment. So we are really focusing on attaining health equity, safety and security for those we serve and adequate social determinants. Next slide, please. As, as has been mentioned before, the COVID pandemic has brought new respect for nurses and uh, everywhere we are, these happen to be local pictures uh, from my university and construction crews on buildings. And we've seen, again, these voices around the world thanking nurses. Nurses don't wanna be called heroes though. They want to be able to be protected, to be able to provide the care and get their own personal emotional support that is needed through these, these uh, weeks and months of just, um, a great deal of anguish. Next slide. One of the other uh, great efforts we saw was the anonymous artist Banksy who presented to Southampton General Hospital in, in London, this black and white image of replacing the traditional uh, co comic book superheroes with a nurse. And I think this was again, a very meaningful transition to recognizing that the entire world has, has seen that nurses, we cannot live without them and we must protect them. Uh, next slide. 
So not just social empowerment because of the role we play and because we speak up for justice, but economic empowerment is important. It, nursing is not just a job, but we must be vigilant. And I bring to your attention, not only do we think of nursing as a well-paid uh, profession in many places, but there are some issues we need to deal with. And it's two ways. We've heard Liz talk about the economic development in countries dependent on our building out of jobs for women. And that's really important. But there was a, a great study that was conducted uh, by the int intra-health part of nursing now that really showed that that women continue to fall behind with pay equity, even in nursing. So we see this across many differences of, of men and women's earning capacity. They described in the study, which is investing in leadership for nursing, that, that men enjoy what, what has been called a glass escalator, meaning they are propelled to leadership positions more quickly. Several reasons for that. One is that women tend to also do the domestic work in, in their countries, and that's unpaid work, and so they often forego educa education at different times in their career and, and advancement into positions. So we all have work to do, both women and men in nursing, to make sure we're leveling the playing field. Next slide, please. I'm going to very quickly uh, show you two slides. Uh, I know you can't you can't see all the details, perhaps, but ICN holds economic forums of the Western nations and Africa and Europe, and then the Asian uh, nations. And these are side by side comparisons at looking at starting salary, and you'll see the dip or the pla that and the plateau that occurred after the last big economic global downturn, 2008 through 2010, but then a recovery more so in in the region other than Asia re recovered a little bit in the Asian regions, but uh, we also see tracking of, of community and hospital salaries keeping pace. Next slide, please. But where we still have work to do is you'll see the, dark, the blue flat line is, is the barometer for nursing salaries where we see other occupations going from top to bottom, physician, accountant, teacher, pol and police, uh, seeing some rise, rate of rise more so than nursing. Next slide. Most, most important is the uh, political empowerment of nurses and really looking at, at making sure that we have uh, actively engaged all of the work that we do to really have influence at the highest levels of our country. So we blend all forces of empowerment together. Next slide. One of the chief ways of doing that is, has been the appointment of a chief nurse at the uh, World Health Organization, Elizabeth Arrow, you see on the left, and together advocating for government chief nurses around the globe. One of the things that was found in the state of the world's nursing was that there is stronger regulatory environments where there is both a chief nurse and leadership development programs. Next slide. So we want to continue to, to advance what nurses do and raise their voices, and we want to do that through many of the programs, some of which are offered by the International Council of Nurses, our, our, our uh, the Leadership for Change program, the Global Leadership for Nursing Institute. Uh, we know that Nursing Now and the Nightingale Challenge is contributing to this. We have a student group that we work with. So there is much going on in terms of saying we must prepare nurses to be comfortable, to be able to speak to power, to be able to influence within our countries. Next slide, please. Um, at every level. In addition, Think about, are, are you putting yourself forward to be appointed to boards? Are you speaking to your elected officials? How are you closing gaps in health equity and health access in your country? And what are you doing to strengthen nursing? Last slide, please. So just to sum up, nursing is truly a pathway to empowerment for nursing. Yes, we have work to do, but we know that key, nurses are key to high value healthcare. We lead with a strong moral compass. We know that our collective power is growing. Our intentional media work is, is escalating that success. The status and profile of, profile of nurses are growing, and we are taking aim on the power imbalances. So we are, we are together and in solidarity are becoming more empowered, and I encourage all of you to, to advance your own empowerment wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. That was fantastic um, and, and so, so encouraging.
My apologies again um, for not having your bio up. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is that Pam has had a career for over 40 years in nursing. Um, so I think that shines through uh, your presentation and that you were also named top 25 women in healthcare um, by the Modern Healthcare Magazine, which is, uh, which is a fantastic accomplishment. Um, you mentioned educational and psychological empowerment, which I think are less mentioned when we speak about um, empowerment. Um, and I also wanted to thank you for mentioning the unpaid work that women take on. I guess the hope is that eventually, as our world does better at gender mm -hmm. equality, um, men and women will share this, this weight equally, which, as you said, will allow women to be furthered empowered in all of those areas. Um, and you also presented some really important tips on how to get involved at the political level or in, or, or in politics. So we're a little bit over time. Um, I hope that most of you can stay on. Um, this is such an important webinar and we have two fantastic speakers um, left. Our two next speakers are Aisha and Anna. Um, Anna Quiroga is a neonatal nurse specialist with over 40 years of experience. In her first 20 years of her career, she worked as a staff nurse and a head nurse in the NICU. And the last 20 years, she's looked at nursing education and public health. Um, Anna has held a number of positions in the maternal and infant health department of the Ministry of Health in Argentina and also works as an advisor for both the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. And she also currently represents Argentina for the International Council of Neonatal Nursing. And Aisha Fall, who we'll hear from um, uh, in the next minute or so, uh, has just recently graduated from Lemon College in Bronx, New York. Um, so congratulations, uh, Aisha. She was on both the president's and the dean's list and is a member of the Delta Zeta chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International. Aisha is also the, the vice president of the African Nursing Student Association Club at Lemon College. So Aisha, we'll start with you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Erica, and thank you everyone for having me today. Um, as you guys can see, this is a picture of my mom, and that, that was me um, seven days after when I was born. Um, I was born in I was born and raised in the Gambia, West Africa. I am the first child of my parents, and being the first child and a female child means a lot in my culture. I'm originally Wolof from the Gambia. My expectations, my roles, my character, my self presentation, and my mannerism. I'm expected to be kind, loving, smart, and serve as a role model to my siblings and my community. My story began at home, raised by loving parents who fought hard to make my life different from theirs. My dad is my hero. He saved me from many family costumes that he believed should not be passed on me, such as female genital mutilation. I was the first um, daughter, the first granddaughter, the first cousin the first niece in my family who did not underwent female genital mutilation, thanks to my dad. Next slide, please. Coming to the US was very challenging. On November 2015, I left everything behind, including my college, studying nursing in Gambia, which was one of, which I was set to graduate in De uh, December 2016, to come to the US to live the American dream and also reconnect with my mom because my mom came to the United States 13 years ago. And um, my American dream is to have a rich opportunity for prosperity and success, quality education, a better job, and also build lasting friendship and connections. I knew my American dream would come with a huge price tag, such as perseverance, patience, self-motivation, hard work, and respect. I had to start all over from learning to adapt to a new environment, learning a new culture that is American culture, navigating my ways using the metro, um, the MTA subway. Everybody know how challenging the MTA is if you're living in New York. And, you know, juggling with bosses, using Google Maps and just figuring things out. Next slide. Fast forward in fall 2016, I started college as a freshman with no friends and missing home. None of my college credits from the Gambia did not transfer, which was very devastating. I was sad as a first child. It was challenging, from, um, it was challenging to set an example to my young siblings. I remember sitting in my first lecture class, 
feeling excited and nervous, asking myself, what the heck did I got myself into? I even planned on going back to, to, to the Gambia to finish college because I felt scared to start all over. Times were tough and overwhelmed, but I kept my head up. Coming to the US was, was a tough decision I've ever made yet. Every day I thank God for making this decision because I feel like I'm living the American dream. Next slide, please. My nursing journey. My nursing journey has been very, you know, very tough. Like I said, um, I moved from the Gambia to here, which I was already in college and most of my credit um, did not transfer. Um, I remember when I first got into college, I met my, um, my freshman pre-nursing advisor. She told me, Aisha, Lima nursing is very competitive. I saw you have, you have very good grades from the Gambia, but your grades cannot be compared to the US grading system. She told me, here students get A's to get into the nursing program. I responded, my, my old college in the Gambia is very competitive as well. If I made it here, I believe I can, I can make it anywhere. She, re she just responded again. I will go ahead and provide you with options of, of other schools that you may want to consider in the future. They're good colleges as well. At this point, I told myself, I did not travel miles to a different continent, which is America, to set myself to fail. A good old memory that I, was, I will always remember. Well, I was one of her best students for the pre-nursing after the first semester, she claimed. Good news is I got into the nursing program with a GPA of 3.8 during, during the fall of 2018. Next slide, please. My life as a nursing student has been um, very competitive, has been very, a lot of challenges come through such as financial burden. Coming from a low income family, I struggle with paying my tuition, getting, getting weekly metro card to use the subway, traveling to and from school, and also going to work. I also work as a nurse's assistant um, at Jacoby Medical Center, which is also in the Bronx. Also just getting um, access to class textbooks, a better internet at home. The school library, the student lounge, and the student life building was my getaway places. I spent most of my time in the library with friends to read and to do work as I had a better access to the internet. I was more comfortable studying there compared to home. This past semester was a low point in my journey as many students when in-person classes were transferred to um, online classes due to COVID-19. I remember scoring poorly in two of my, um, my exam classes due to poor internet. I had no choice. I spoke to my instructors. There was nothing they could do to help me to retake the exam. I had no choice but to make arrangements with a friend to do all my remaining classwork and final exams at their home because they had a better internet connection. Times were tough. They were overwhelmed, but I kept my head up and I graduated with honors. Next slide. Being a nursing student has helped my mom to consider going back to college. She dropped out of pre-nursing also when she was pregnant with my little sister 10 years ago. She was scared to go back to school because she believed she could not handle the stress of school. After many uh, motivational talks and encouragement, my mom enrolled back to college. She graduated with an associate in liberal arts last December. Congrats to her, I love you mom. And she is three semesters away from graduating with her bachelor's of science in nursing. I wish her good luck. Over the four years of my journey, I decided to help others that struggle as I did. During my freshman, after my first semester, I signed up to be a peer mentor during my second semester in college for incoming freshman students, pre-nursing students, and also served as an after-school um, math and science tutor for young kids. I also volunteered my time to serve my community and abroad in Nicaragua and Peru, I traveled to Nicaragua and Peru um, two, two, two semesters ago in the summer and the, sum, the spring of 2018 and the summer of 2019. Basically, I was shadowing um, doctors and nurses in most of the, some of the clinics in Peru and Nicaragua 
providing access to healthcare to the community. I also served as the Vice President of African Student Nursing Association at Lehman while, as, while, while working as a nurse's, student, nurse's assistant. So I worked as a nurse's assistant, like I said, basically um, to gain experience to know what nursing is all about in the US. And also basically just to um, save more money to help pay for my college expenses. At the end of everything, I made it. Four years later, on May 28, 2020, I graduated from CUNY Lehman College which, uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing with a cum laude and a GPA of 3.65. I'm always excited to say that after all the hard work and everything. I was also inducted to Sigma Delta um, Beta chapter of Sigma, which I'm always very proud of, and also um, to Tau Sigma Honor Society. During my journey, I met inspiring faculty, staff, mentors, friends, who made my college life memorable. I had so many challenges along the way, but one thing kept me going, my enthusiasm for education, my love to help, and my dream of becoming a nurse. Thank you for having me. I hope you all stay well and safe. Aisha, thank you so, so much. Congratulations again on your graduation and especially with honors. Um, you've overcome so many barriers and uh, we're so happy that you chose a nursing career. Um, I can certainly say your determination and perseverance will take you very, very far. And I think everyone on this webinar um, would probably share the same sentiment. I'm very excited for what lies ahead of you. Thank you so much for that very vulnerable and honest um, and uh, uh, yeah, fantastic presentation. So Anna, the floor is yours. You're the final speaker. Um, Anna Kiroga, go ahead, please. Well, thank you very much. Good morning to all the assistants to the webinar and many thanks to let me share with you the my, my professional experience uh, and how nursing has empowered me as a woman. Next slide, please. I, I'm from Argentina, South America, as you see in the map, and my country has 44 million inhabitants. We have almost 700,000 uh, live births, and infant mortality rate is not so high, but 60% of the infant mortality is neonatal, as it, as it is uh, global. So, about 4,000 babies die uh, at the delivery room on it or in their first week of life. Next slide, please. So when I started in 1978, my professional status, um, I couldn't visualize at that moment all the challenges the profession will put me on. And I do accept, accept this, those challenges. And looking back at, at those times, nurses was quite different from now. After 40 years in my country, nursing has uh, go a, a very good way of uh, professionalism, and, and and many of the nurses have now the the bachelor in science of nursing. So. Uh, and at that moment, also the the medical we have a very hegemonic medical model that was very difficult to consider nurses as a, as an equal part of the team, and this is changed nowadays. So in my current positions, like a director of the of a program of for neonatal nurses in the Austrian University or at the Ministry of Health, or also coordinating nursing chap chapters in scientific societies, I can see that my career could be a humble expression of how nursing can uh, empower uh, women. Next slide, please. From my clinical experience, I started make, making a difference because I think I struggle uh, to be an, an active part of the decision making progress with the, with the, within the teams. And I always encourage nurses in all these different positions to, to have a, 
a full participation in, in decision making so on care of the babies. So I think that um, they have a, an active participation with doctors and this was not the usual uh, very usual in, in 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 the first time. So it become I saw the pool question will say that that the there is increasing increasing awareness of the how uh, the nurses are very important for the for the team and for caring people. So this is what I think I I pursue in all my clinical experience to not only as be part of the, the the decision the make decision making process you know encourage nurses to do so next slide please um i i also uh, have the the commit the commitment with the education of nursing because i believe i truly believe the uh, empowerment through education uh, most of the nurses when I started practice practice learn uh, from other colleagues or by imitation and I think that uh, the academic environment gave them all the tools to have a uh, decision making power over the care of newborns so uh, I think I'm the first and the only postgraduate nurse in neonatal nursing uh, career in uh, uh, at the Austral University in my country, and it's accredited by the Ministry of Education. So many nurses in the units are now uh, having the, the postgraduate uh, title, and this is very uh, important for them and for to be part of the team. Next slide, please. So, um, I, I can tell you my clinical experience and working in units and then the educational part that I started educating nurses in 1992 and then in 2003 I, I entered as volunteer in the, at the Ministry of Health was a national program for prevention for the prevention of blindness in childhood uh, due to retinopathy of preterm because this was an, an epidemic and uh, very uh, important issue of morbidity in preterm uh, uh, babies. And this was absolutely related to nursing care and the use of oxygen. So I, I started uh, volunteering in, in this program and I went all over the country and almost in all countries in Latin America and teaching nurses on primary prevention of this, of, of this morbidity that is very, uh, has an, an important social impact in those families that have a, a blind kid. So I also participate and as a speaker in national and international conference on neonatal nursing. For example, I was invited for the World Rock Conference in Shanghai in, in 2012. So I think that leading this as nurse leading the nursing care in this program was very important for me, for my country, and for the also for the region. Next slide, please. I after volunteering in that program, as I was offered at the maternal infant direction in the Ministry of Health, the permanent position. And I, from this year to uh, nowadays, I covered very different positions. One of them was to coordinate all the neonatal area with a team of doctors and nurses. I was responsible for the coordination of all the team that they established public policies about neonatal care for the whole country. So I was really very proud of, of this participation in, 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 the, in this area because it gave me the opportunity to lead uh, the substantial nursing role in 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 prevention and and contribute with my perspective and expertise to to the strategic improvement of quality patient care in in for the whole country so i also 
in the past four years was uh, very close to the to the national director of the maternal infant health and was the technical assistant of the whole direction and i am now coordinating uh, the national program of, of prevention of blindness in childhood due to retinopathy of preterm uh, is also a team of doctor and nurses and of uh, neonatologists, ophthalmologists and nurses that, that work together to diminish the number of, of babies uh, that are affected with this uh, uh, morbidity that, that is uh, very, uh, is an indicator of neonatal care. So this is a uh, what I'm doing now and how I move from clinical to educational and I do, do this both things together and now I'm and also in public health. Next slide, please. So as, as Erica said, I also cover different positions as temporary advisor for uh, WHO Bajo. I work with UNICEF in in as uh, the campaign on preterm week. Uh, I work for in Latin America for different workshops in ROP prevention. I am the country representative of COIN. I start the international conference on neonatal nursing in my country, inviting nurses from abroad, uh, most of them from the from United States, uh, and they were in, in, in Buenos Aires City. I also participate as director of collaboration programs with universities from abroad, uh, like NYU, Rutgers, and Pittsburgh. And I have the chance to publish different articles related to neonatal care, mostly on, on prevention of ROP or retinopathy of preterm in local journals and international like clinics in perinatology, community eye health journal and for uh, WHO. Next slide, please. So as final remarks, I, uh, I always have the advocacy of, uh, for newborns and this was, was conducting my professional life. I, my 42 years of experience as a, as a nurse, I dedicate to the neonatal care. I strongly believe that nurses make a difference. Uh, I was very interested in public health because uh, my country is, uh, I think, the globe. The, all the many countries are have a inequality in care, and so I was always trying to reduce inequality in care for the babies born in my country and in, in the region. I also think I have an impact in infant blindness due to ROP. I have the chance to combine clinical expertise with education and into the influence I could put on public health. I always accepted professional challenge, uh, challenges and I'm absolutely convinced, convinced that young professionals are our future and we have to, to be role modeling and give them all the opportunities and educate them in, in leadership and how to uh, put our voice in, in different, in different uh, areas and as you said in the media, in education, research or, or clinical, so it's very important. So I'm absolutely convinced that nursing is a pathway to women empowerment and we need that all nurses believe that participation in decision making progress process sorry is necessary and avoidable so thank you very much anna thank you so much um, for sharing your story with us uh, you've had a very impressive career um, and it's it's very clear how a nursing career has empowered you to have such great impact um, especially in neonatal care in argentina
Um, so this concludes our thoughtful panel's presentations. Um, we will now take a few questions. Uh, we are over time, but we have a lot of um, participants still online. So that's fantastic. Um, please submit any questions, thoughts, or comments um, in the questions panel on your control panel. Um, and if you've not done so already, please enter in what capacity you work in healthcare. Um, I do have a question that has already come up. Um, and I will uh, let whichever um, uh, presenter answer this, um, perhaps Lisa or Pam or Liz. Um, oh, I'm sorry, technology. Um, and so the question is, as a retired nurse educator with 40 plus years experience in nursing, how can they be most active in the process? I assume that refers to um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this, this person asks, since although they are quite healthy, they are in a vulnerable age group due to COVID-19 pandemic. So well, how they can be most effective, um, I guess, in you know, um, post-nursing uh, career um, and considering the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, sure, I can I can take a, a, an attempt at that. So one of the roles that have played out here in Canada for some of our uh, nurses who have retired or are near retirement and again are in that vulnerable situation is that they have um, supported the public health measures with the daily monitoring of patients who are COVID positive. So they're able to make those telephone calls to patients um, who are positive or on um, in, under investigation for COVID-19. So they do that from their home. There's no exposure for them in person to anyone, but certainly a much valuable and needed role within public health. Fantastic. Does anybody else, any of the panelists also want to answer that question from their experience in their countries, how nurses are getting involved um, and, and contributing? Um, there was also a question earlier, um, and I think they were referring to a slide in Lisa's presentation, um, where the 600 nursing deaths were from. Um, I did answer that ICN was collecting data from our national nursing associations um, and from media reports um, and other information um, that is available to us. But I don't know if, Lisa, you wanted to comment um, any more on that. Uh, no, I don't have anything more to add. You're right, Eric. I don't know if Pam, you have anything more you wanted to add? I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Because I'm not sure if my audio is working on this other computer. Yeah, we can you can. Hear you. Okay. Yeah. So the, the the reports that are coming in are really worldwide, and I believe we are trying to refine them. Uh, we don't have that database ready to turn around, but I but the request has gone out to countries to please submit the numbers that they have. We know that not all countries are very good at, at collecting uh, and reporting those data, but uh, there is a, an interest worldwide in being able to quantify, but also recognize kind of where these deaths have occurred. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I don't see any more questions coming in, um, and we we are over time. So um, I will just say from the question panel that I can see, we have such a great mix of participants. We have um, deans, professors, we have lecturers, we have retired RNs who are volunteers. Um, we have students and doctoral candidates, public health nurses, nurses working in med surge. Um, critical care nurses, nurse educators, and women health um, nurse practitioners. So a really fantastic mix of participants. I want to personally thank all of the panelists. I will, though, hand it over um, to Becky for you to conclude um, this webinar for the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, again. We appreciate your, uh, <clears throat> your commitment to the nursing profession, and we've had some great information, great discussion today. Sigma and ICN are also grateful that you took the time to share uh, with this audience and look forward to hearing more from the panelists in the future. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars and podcasts are freely available on the Sigma repository. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you.